Good morning, everyone. Getting going a couple minutes before 10 to give people a chance to sign on for our Sunday morning worship service. It's good to be with you in this way. Just giving people a chance to sign on. Welcome, we're just giving people a chance to sign on before we begin at 10. Hi everyone, I see you signing on. I'm so glad you can, that we can be together this morning for this worship service. Hello, hello. Got just a little bit more time and then we'll begin. I'm excited that Doug Thorpe is preaching this morning through the wonders of technology. And we're even going to have a hymn. We're gonna have a hymn at the end. Very exciting. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Some of you probably know, I can see when you sign on, it's so great to see all of you signing on to worship, for us to worship together this morning. And I'm just giving people a chance to do that, to join us, and then we will begin at 10 in any, any moment now. It is 10 o'clock. Welcome everyone to our Sunday morning worship service coming to you from Holy Comforter, the Church of the Holy Comforter in Richmond, Virginia. I'm Hilary Smith, the rector, and this service is brought to you by all the members and friends and clergy at Holy Comforter. We're so glad to be with you today. We're going to have a hymn at the end, toward the end of the service, and I will say more as we get into it. So we're beginning with, this is Lent, this is the fourth Sunday in Lent, and so we begin with what we call a penitential order, which is a chance to really just to open ourselves to God's love is what this is really about. So if you have the bulletin, please follow along with the bulletin. If you don't have a bulletin, that's fine. You'll be able to follow along. But if you'd like to get it, um, there is a link on the Facebook page and also it is on our Holy Comforter website, hoko.org, under worship. Okay, here we go. Sometimes I'll say the responses, sometimes I won't. I'll probably say this one. Blessed be the God of our salvation, who bears our burdens and forgives our sins. Jesus said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And now we are invited to confess our sins against God and our neighbor. And I'm going to allow some silent time for us to bring to mind anything for which we desire forgiveness, healing, hope. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is taken from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, it is from 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. 
The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I named to you. Saul did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, they looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abimadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then went out and went to Ramah. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. What a great reading, right? <laughs> That's so great. The Lord does not judge on outward appearances, but on what is in the heart. And we're always surprised, often, right, by God. All right, on to Psalm 23. This is the contemporary version found in your bulletin. It is also on page 612 of the Book of Common Prayer, if you're using the Book of Common Prayer or have one around. And if you want to say it in the King James Version, please do. And we'll say it in unison. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I wonder how you're hearing that psalm today, given our situation. Scripture is amazing. Scripture 
is the living word of God and speaks to us in the context in which we find ourselves powerfully. And now reading from John's gospel, this is John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41, and I'm going to announce it in the way we would do if we were at church. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. The parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world has never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. 
If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and you were trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now you say, We see. Now that you say, We see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. And now for the sermon. Please bear with me as I set up for that. And I'm going to do a little bit here. Okay. I'm going to turn this around for us. And I'm going to start it. Good morning. Please pray with me. Let your light, O oh God, shine in our hearts that we may see you. Let your light shine forth from our lives that others may see you and give you praise. Amen. If, like me, you are a fan of Ernest Hemingway, you can probably recognize his style at a glance. That taut economy of language, the simple declarative sentences, the strong action verbs, the exaggerated understatement. It's a style that practically begs to be parodied. For nearly 30 years, the Bad Hemingway Contest did exactly that. Authors were invited to submit one really good page of really bad Hemingway. And there were only two rules. The piece had to mention Harry's Bar and Grill in Venice, which was one of Hemingway's favorite watering holes, and it had to be funny. Here's a sample, and I'm quoting from memory here, so, so don't hold me to uh, the exact wording, but you'll get the idea. Nick pushed the cart down the grocery store aisle. The cart was made of steel. It was a good cart. Nick reached deep into the freezer chest. He pulled out a can of frozen orange juice. He turned and saw Bill at the end of the aisle. This can is cold, said Nick. Yes, said Bill. The cans are always cold. That's the way things are here. And on and on it goes like that. You get the point. I propose that we do for theology what this competition did for Hemingway. What I have in mind is an annual competition called the best of bad theology. The rules would be simple. Entries would, be, uh, would not be judged on style. Theological writing never has any style. Entries would be judged according to how well they presented the perennial favorites of bad theology. The objective here would be to recycle theological ideas that have long been discarded by the church, but continue to be popular. I don't expect anyone to take me seriously enough to actually organize such a contest, but if we're forced to shelter in place for more than a week, we might take it up as a way to fight boredom. If we held the contest, though, I think I could predict what the winning entries would be. Hillary proposed one contender in her sermon last week, the prosperity gospel. This favorite bad theology says that if we do the right thing, 
if we utter the right formula, God will necessarily bless us and bless us uh, primarily financially or materially. In fact, God will have to make us prosperous as if we could force the hand of God. And the corollary is that if we're not rich, then obviously we have not made God happy. I think the prosperity gospel would be a strong contender for the prize of best bad theology. But if I were judging the contest, I'd award the blue ribbon to a related but somewhat different idea. I'd give the top prize to the phrase, everything happens for a reason. In her mid-30s, Kate Boulder was living her dream life. After receiving her PhD, she got the first job she applied for, and it was a good one. She was teaching the history of Christianity in America at Duke Divinity School. She had published a book on, of all things, the prosperity gospel. She was married and raising a beautiful boy. Then she unexpectedly was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Writing in the New York Times four years ago, about a year after the initial diagnosis and surgeries, Bowler described her experience. I am 35, she wrote. I did the things you might expect of someone whose world has suddenly become very small. I sank to my knees and cried. I called my husband at our home nearby. I waited until he arrived so we could wrap our arms around each other and say the things that must be said. I have loved you forever. I am so grateful for our life together. Please take care of our son. Then he walked me from my office to the hospital to start what was left of my new life. It was not long before a neighbor knocked on the bowler's door to tell Kate's husband that everything happens for a reason. Here's Kate again. I'd love to hear it, my husband said. Pardon, she said startled. I'd love to hear the reason my wife is dying, he said, in that sweet and sour way of his. In today's gospel, the Pharisees give voice to the idea that everything happens for a reason. Who sinned, they asked, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Being born blind is a bad thing, obviously. There must be a reason that happened, and the reason must be tied to someone's sin. Since a man was born blind, it's kind of hard to imagine that his sin was the reason, unless he was violating the Ten Commandments in his mother's womb. Was his parents' sin the reason he was born blind? Hidden behind the Pharisees' question, of course, is the question that we all ask. How can I avoid the same fate? What do I have to do to keep from going blind or getting cancer? How much control do I really have? If I drink a kale smoothie with flax seeds every morning, will it help me fight off the coronavirus? Jesus sidesteps this question of blame and of cause and therefore of control. He takes the man's blindness as a given, a fact of life without any clear reason. And then he gets to work. We must work the works of him who sent me Well, it is day, he said. And then he heals the man and restores his vision. As frustrating as it may be, Christian faith has never offered us a completely satisfying answer to the question of why bad things happen, even to good people. What it does offer us, though, is the ongoing work of redemption. Truly bad things happen. People are born blind. They catch viruses. They get cancer. We catch viruses. We 
get cancer. Christ is crucified. We can't find truly satisfactory reasons. But we do know that God stares these horrible things squarely in the face and then gets to work. God never lets the bad have the last word, but goes on pulling for good, working to bring forward something better, even out of tragic situations. Jesus is raised to new life. The blind man receives his sight. This is our work, to face the worst head on, to not blink or slide away or explain away suffering but to look it squarely in the face and then get to work. Bring light. Bring good. When Marion Shepherd began to lose her sight, she reacted as most of us might. She cried. She felt sorry for herself. She raged in anger. She asked why and she feared the loss of freedom. Frank Bruni wrote about Shepard in a recent column. She spent months wrestling with those emotions until she realized that they had pinned her in place. Time was marching on and she wasn't moving at all. Her choice was clear. She could surrender to the darkness or she could dance. She danced. When Bruni caught up with her recently, Shepard, age 73, was leading a line dancing class for older adults with visual impairment. We've got to keep moving, she said. You know why? Because we're alive. As long as we're alive, we have to keep moving. You and I may be apart from one another this morning, but we're alive, and God is alive, and God is working among us and through us for the ongoing redemption of the world. I am sorry for the technical difficulties there. I'm just figuring out how to do this. <clears throat> sorry the image was a little bit jiggly. Next time, I'll figure that out. <laughs> and thank you to J Doug Thorpe for preaching. Um, if you don't have the bulletin and you're not familiar with Doug, let me tell you a little bit about him. Um, Doug is the executive director of the Virginia Institute of Pastoral Care, a member of Holy Comforter's Choir, he is ordained in the Evangelical Covenant Church, which is a denomination of the Lutheran family of churches. He is married to Mary Thorpe, who is canon to the ordinary of the Diocese of Virginia and a priest in residence at Holy Comforter. Thank you, Doug, so much for your wisdom, your words this morning. We're now moving into the prayers of the people. We join our hearts and voices to offer our prayers for healing to God. And I'll note that originally on this Sunday, we were planning to do the laying on of hands for healing as a main part of the service at church. Um, so these prayers were geared towards that, and now they are geared towards the situation in which we find ourselves. These are lovely prayers. Let me tell you where they're from in case you don't have the bulletin. Prayers of the People are by the Right Reverend Geraldine Wolfe and found in Planning for Rites and Rituals, which is put out by Church Publishing. Continuing. Christ our Lord, long ago in Galilee, many who were sick and suffering needed friends to bring them to your side. Confident of your goodness, we now bring to you those who need your healing touch. We name before you those who are ill in body, whose sickness is long or painful or difficult to cure, those who suffer restless days 
and sleepless nights. And names of specific persons may be said aloud by typing their names in or saying them where you are with the people you may be with or in the silence of our hearts. At the conclusion of each of these prayers, I'll say, Christ, lover of all, and the response is, bring healing, bring peace. Christ, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. We name before you those who are troubled in mind, distressed by the past, or dreading the future, those who are trapped and cast down by fear. And you're invited to name specific persons again in the same way. Jesus Christ, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. We name before you those for whom light has been turned to darkness by the death of a loved one, the breaking of a friendship, or the fading of hope. Jesus Christ, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. We ask your guidance for those who are engaged in medical research, that they may persevere with vision and energy. And for those who administer agencies of health and welfare, that they may have wisdom and compassion. Jesus Christ, lover of all, bring healing, bring peace. Knowing that Jesus opens the eyes of the blind, gives voice to the voiceless, and frees those who are imprisoned by fear, let us with confidence continue our prayers. And I invite your prayers silently or aloud once again. God, we thank you for bringing us together today that we can pray in community through this method. We pray for all those who are sick, all those suffering from the coronavirus or any other illness, those who have had surgery or are anticipating surgery. Uh, we pray for all those who've died. We give thanks for their life, their lives, and pray that we may know that they continue to go from strength to strength in you. And we give thanks for all the joys of life, for new life, um, those who've been born recently, for um, sparks and moments of grace in the midst of challenges. Pray for your continued guidance as we discern the best way forward in being community during this time. Almighty God, giver of life and health, your son came into this ailing world to make your children whole. Send your blessing on all those who are sick and on all who minister to them, that when they are restored to health of body and mind, they may give thanks to you in your church. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we are going to have a hymn. 
The hymn, if you happen to have the hymnal 1982, is hymn 686, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. This could also be looked up on your device. Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. And this is being sung by Lisa and Emily. And I may try to have a more stable base for this little shared video. Let's see how I can do this. Please bear with me as we continue to figure all this out. Okay. Okay, and now I have to go to a different place on my computer. One second, sorry. It's just kind of loading up here. Okay, here we go. It's coming. Here we go. Okay, make it bigger. And I'll try this on my new base I've got going. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll go back to this. Hold on. Hmm. I have no idea why that happened. All right. Let's see. I'm going to go over here and you can look at at this cross up here for a second while I figure this out. All right. All right. I'm excited. I think this may work. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me Wonderful, wonderful, yay.
Thank you, Lisa and Emily, for that. That was just beautiful. Now the peace, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And a blessing, the blessing of God who loves you so much, who holds us all close. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much for joining with Holy Comforter this morning for our online worship service. A couple of other announcements I wanted to make. We are doing a lot of things on Zoom meetings. I noticed in the bulletin I forgot to take out of the calendar the Monday night Bible study. Obviously that is not happening at the church. But if there are people in the Monday night Bible study who would like to meet in a Zoom meeting, and meet, um, please let me know because I'm organizing these. We are having our Lenten program Wednesday night by Zoom. If you'd like to be a part of that, please give me your email address and I'll invite you to join us. Um, and other things, uh, the book club. The book club is also gonna be happening um, on March 31st as a Zoom meeting. So I'm excited that we can meet. <laughs> it's not the same, it's not what we want, but at least it is something, and it is through God's grace that we can stay connected in these ways. I wish you a wonderful Sunday. If you'd like to come back at 4.30, I'll be doing the story time service with my dog Dash and Dave the Dinosaur, 4.30 today, and a new feature we have coming, um, Brian Justice, who is training to be a deacon and is stationed at Holy Comforter, will be leading Compline tonight at 8 p.m., He'll be doing this on Friday nights and Sunday nights going forward is what we're planning right now. And we're going to add in some other people too as we go along. God bless you. Take care.